Good evening and welcome to the British Library. My name is Rob and I work in the cultural events team here. This year of 2021 marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of a literary giant, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Tonight's talk will be chaired by author, comedian, podcaster and broadcaster Viv Groskov. Viv will be joined by a panel of speakers spanning across a wide array of disciplines and they will be discussing their work adapting and translating Dostoevsky material and how it is still as relevant today as it's always been. So please join me in thanking them for being part of tonight's event and thank you for coming along. We hope to see you very soon in person in the library but for now it's back to you Viv. Good evening, Dobre Vecha, and welcome to this event celebrating Dostoevsky. I know you will be here knowing that his birthday is coming up on Thursday. He would have been 200. So we're thrilled to be celebrating this special event and trying to bring him in a way back to life. Um, not that anybody would like to see a 200 year old Dostoevsky, or maybe some, some of us would. It's just been Halloween. Uh, but we're trying to examine what is it about Dostoevsky and his work that is still alive today? What does living Dostoevsky look like in the world of theatre, in the world of biography, in the world of translation and academia? Why is he still relevant today and why does he deserve to be celebrated 200 years after his birth, birth day? I am Viv Groskop. I'm the author of the Anna Karenina Fix, which was published as Samorozitia Patolstomo in Russia. It was a bestseller in lockdown Russia, and it has a chapter, of course, on crime and punishment. And joining me today are three fellow Dostoevsky obsessives, all with a different take on his life and work. Uh, we're so thrilled to welcome all of you um, who have tuned in, and we'd love to hear your comments and questions, uh, anything you have to say about your favourite works of Dostoevsky, any questions that you have that come up through the course of this conversation. And we're going to be on here until about 8.45 and we'll come to questions in the final half hour. But don't wait until then to put your questions in the box below or any comments that you might have, anything you want us to dig into deeper, anything you disagree with, uh, anything that you'd love us to explain a bit further, any questions that you have at any time, just pop them in the box below um, and we'll get to them in the last part of this discussion. So let me come to our guests today. I'm going to introduce each of them uh, in turn and then we'll come to each of them and discuss a little bit about their connection to Dostoevsky. We have Dr. Oliver Reddy, is, who is a University of Oxford based literary scholar and translator specialising in Russian prose of the late and post-Soviet period and of course in the 19th century classics especially Gogol and Dostoevsky. Oliver has translated many works of Russian literature including Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment for which he was shortlisted for the Penn Translation Prize. His other commendations include the International Read Russia Prize and the Rossica Prize. Oliver serves on the editorial board of the Russian Library and was consultant editor for Russian and East Central Europe at the Times Literary Supplement. Oliver, a quick word on your favourite Dostoevsky. I would be letting the side down if I said anything other than crime and punishment, but I also love Brothers Karamazov especially and, and also Notes from the Dead House, his book from Siberia very apt answer. It's a very university challenge style answer as well. I love that. Uh, our second guest today is Alex Christoffi, who is editorial director at Transworld Publishing and has written for many publications, including The Guardian, New Humanist, Prospect, The White Review, The Brixton Review of Books and The London Magazine. He's also a novelist. His published fiction includes Let Us Be True and Glass, for which he was awarded the Betty Trask Prize and was long listed for the Desmond Elliott Prize. He's here today representing his wonderful biography, which I can't recommend highly enough, Dostoevsky in Love, which is his first published work of non-fiction. Alex, coming from the biography side, is there an adjective you would use to sum up Dostoevsky's personality? Uh, oh, if it comes to personality, um, I think the, the one best word is probably argumentative. Uh, he he loved an argument, and um, 
and he he always thought he was right and to be fair to him you know very often he was fantastic i love that he was a very argumentative person and has many argumentative characters in his fiction our third guest is Elizabeth Newman, who has been artistic director of the Pitt Lockery Festival Theatre in Perthshire, Scotland, since 2018. In 2020, she won Best Director at the prestigious Critics Awards for Theatre in Scotland. Prior to this, Elizabeth held the position of artistic director at the Bolton Octagon Theatre. Elizabeth adapted and directed a stage version of Dostoevsky's White Nights, which was performed at Pitlochry Festival Theatre. Elizabeth, my quick question to you is, do you think Dostoevsky would have enjoyed your adaptation of White Nights? Um, I hope he would have done. Um, I think he would have loved Brian's performance, um, who played the dreamer. Um, yeah, so I, ho I hope he would have seen himself in it um, and had a good chuckle at the funny bits and hopefully would have been very moved at the end, which is what I think he was intending. Fantastic. Welcome to all three of our guests. Thank you so much for joining us. Oliver, let me come to you first of all as the uh, translator of our panel um, for your translation of Crime and Punishment, of course. Tell us what was your initial connection with Dostoevsky and what connects you to him now? Good question. Um, I, so I think I read Crime and Punishment for the first time and it was probably the first Dostoevsky book I read um, in my mid to late teens. And I think that's very typical when I was working on the translation, so many other people told me the same thing. And it's actually one thing that works against the novel in a way because people, read it back in their youth, sort of forget it. They read it at the time in a way that almost Raskolnikov, the, the main character, is also in that kind of stage of his life of the cusp of maturity, and often look back on it and think, somehow it's not such a serious novel or such an important one, Brothers Karamazov or whatever is the real thing. And um, and so I think I, I'd, I'd followed that path as well in a way and uh, had put Dostoevsky aside a bit, especially because I did Russian as an undergraduate, and I think I managed to get through my undergraduate career without reading a further line of Dostoevsky. So um, then being asked to translate Crime and Punishment 10 years after that could be seen as, 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 as a recompense or punishment for, for, for my ne neglect. Um, I think I've been very influenced by some of the crit 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 critics of Dostoevsky, I mean, most influentially Nabokov, um, who sort of portrayed him as this purveyor of cheap thrills, uh, who wrote badly, um, just wasn't a proper artist, and whose characters sinned their way to Jesus, as, as he put it. And I hadn't really tested those big, strong opinions for, for myself. So, I mean, as a translator, I think there are two kinds of projects you do. Either you, you find the book and you champion the author and you go to the publisher with it and you stick by it, whether it wins the international book or sells 100 copies as is often the case or 200 um, or the book finds you and this was very much the latter the latter category and uh, when, when I was asked whether I'd consider doing it I was it was a bit I was a bit like Raskolnikov on the first page I was in two minds about it wondering whether this was something you know this would be this was going to be the 11th translation I think into English I knew it would take me a very long time uh, and it did uh, about five years um, but uh, but no in, in retrospect it was uh, yeah a, a, an amazing experience for me and um, I think from the moment I sat down and read the first chapter properly in Russian and considered the challenges it, it, it posed to the translator and just fell into this um, you know Dostoevsky plunges us right away into this heat wave of St Petersburg in the year or the year just before he's writing and everything about uh, the place is just like uh, the interior of Raskolnikov's own mind is kind of airless, constricted, everyone's living on top of each other. The sentences themselves seem to be sort of living on top of each other, jagged against each other. There's nothing smooth about it. And I knew it was going to sort of push me into a sort of area as a translator I hadn't um, been into. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think literary translation at its most enjoyable, and although we always talk about translation as about difficulty and challenges, it is actually really enjoyable. And one of the, one of the things that's so enjoyable about it is that a book is, you know, a voyage of discovery as you're translating it, where you end up at the end of it is so, your understanding of that book is so different from where you started. Um, and I remember those, that time as a very, very happy period in terms of working on the book. I, I put everything aside. The only time in my life I've just worked on paper. I even closed the la laptop 
and I tried to have this sort of very intimate engagement with, with the text, writing out my translation um, by hand. And um, yeah, it was a, a very sort of serene experience. And maybe this connects a bit with Alex's work. It, it, I think for Dostoevsky himself, um, that novel, although it's about murder and it's about violence, it's written from a very serene perspective, I think. Not what you feel when you read it, when you're caught up in the Chronicles mind, but it's, um, it comes from a place of sort of great experience and Dostoevsky's part, he himself had almost been executed, as we know, he spent time in Siberia. He then come back and tried to revive his literary career. And you know, he was in his mid forties when he wrote this. Um, so, um, and we get that sense of serenity when we finally get to the epilogue. But, um, and yeah, translating it, I just discovered lots of things that I, I, I simply didn't realize beforehand. One is how saturated the novel is in comedy. Um, and I don't mean that in a sort of trivial sense, you know, that there are comic bits or whatever, or that there are comic scenes, but that the whole underpinning of it is comedic as well as serious. And it's partly to do, I think, with the fact that the main character has these growing delusions about who he is, that he's some kind of Superman. And it's that gap between who we know he is and who he thinks he is or wants to be, that, that, that it's the heart of the comedy. And then Dostoevsky creates these astonishing other comic, comic characters, um, Madame Elado very early on, the drunkard in the tavern, and then much later, the investigator who bounces around his office like a, uh, like a rubber ball uh, as he's interrogating Raskolnikov, uh, cackling away and you know, torturing him in a sense. The interrogation is a sort of verbal torture, but also driving him, driving him mad, but also driving him sane, partly through his humor, getting, getting Raskolnikov to know himself better, which is what this, this book ultimately is, is about from, from Raskolnikov's point of view. Like all of Dostoevsky's novels, it's about uh, you know, the, the journey towards some kind of self-knowledge, or at least some movement towards that, which I think is also why if we're talking about relevance. Um, Dostoevsky still has so much to give us in terms of you know, how, um, it's a book actually about words much more than it is about deeds. Although it seems to be about deeds, it seems to be about bloody murders. Actually, the murders happen very quickly. The rest of the novel, develops through conversations, uh, long but very compelling conversations through which gradually Raskolnikov begins to understand himself much better. And, um, and so, yes, it's a story about brutal murders and the way that those murders rise up in his unconscious. He has all these horrible dreams and he's processing it. But at a conscious level, it's sort of talking to a book in a way in which a, a book about healing um, to some extent um, and I think it has a lot still to offer, Dostoevsky does in general, to, you know, when we have a sort of plague of self-hatred, I think, in society and self-criticism. Uh, what, what Dostoevsky is working, he's working with that very similar material, I think, and it helps us to understand the paths by which people can uh, reconnect with each other, sort of acknowledge uh, the reality of one another, the, the value of other people. That's really what happens to, to Raskolnikov. I don't think he's redeemed and we can turn, return to that later, perhaps, because I think that links to the whole topic of adaptation. Nobody within the course of a Dostoevsky novel is redeemed. There's no end point. There was always, they're always capable of lapsing back into the former self or whatever, but, um, but there is that kind of that progress, um, yeah, to do better understanding. Mm. Thank, Thank you, you, Oliver, for that incredible overview. So many contradictions already that speak to how complicated and rich Dostoevsky's work is and, and him as a person. Uh, this contradiction already in the course of this conversation of Alex using the word argumentative to sum him up and yet Oliver bringing in this idea that his work is actually serene. Uh, and there's just so much to explore there. Um, Alex, how does that portrait fit in with your work as a biographer and how you came to approach Dostoevsky in love, which in itself seems a mad title for a book about Dostoevsky. Yeah, it, so it's really interesting that idea that Raskolnikov is kind of, um, that there's this sort of very overt textuality in Crime and Punishment. And it's there in a lot of his other books as well. So, you know, there's this moment um, in, in Notes from the Underground where uh, the underground man, the main character, gets accused of talking like he was in a book. And there's, there is something sort of that Dostoevsky found strangely literary about his own life. He, he was so immersed in books that he could never really separate the two. So the, the um, example that comes to mind is that this, 
you know, obviously traumatic event, the uh, a staged mock execution, which was part of his punishment, and he was obviously then sent on to Siberia um, for, for uh, sedition. He'd been in a circle of writers who were challenging um, some of the Tsar's authority. And, uh, and even when he genuinely believed that he had a minute left to live, he reflected afterwards that it reminded him quite a lot of, of this Victor Hugo novel. And it gave him this great idea um, for a book because he, uh, he, he realized that there, were, there was this moment in, in the last day of a condemned man. He couldn't really be narrating his own last day for obvious reasons. He, he doesn't survive it. Um, and it kind of switched on a light bulb and it started firing all, all these literary ideas off for Dostoevsky. So actually, in some ways, he thought of books and life as, be, as having this sort of deeply interconnected um, relationship. And so what, one of the things I was trying to do with, with my book uh, was um, I, I knew that he had wanted to write his memoirs and I knew that some of his fiction that he'd, he'd written across his life uh, there were these passages in it that, that were clearly autobiographical. Um, he writes about the, his characters, talk about the experience of epilepsy. Um, the mock execution is referred to more than once. Um, and there are other novels that are clearly based on single episodes in, in his life, clearly defined moments. So there's a, a, a period when he had a terrible gambling slash relationship trips to Europe which he was chasing a, a young woman called Polina around Europe and and hoping that it would become a relationship and he lost all his money playing roulette there is a novel called The Gambler about a young man who's just losing all his money at roulette and uh, and chasing after a young woman called Polina and it and and so you know the the thing that you're you're always told not to do uh, in writing non-fiction is to uh to blur the boundary between fiction and non-fiction I was kind of interested to see what would happen if, if I removed that injunction and tried to see how much the, the life and the work could speak to each other in a way that, that, that maybe an academic wouldn't want to do and, and it, wouldn't, it would feel like it sort of violate, violated those uh, academic rules of, of true scholarship. Um, so I, I thought of it initially as if it was going to be a, a kind of reconstructed memoir that would all be in his voice. And I realized quite quickly that that would be pretty hard to, uh, it would be quite short and it would be full of gaps. And so I, I kind of came to a method where it was a sort of dialogue in a way between uh, the first person narration that was drawn from his writings and me uh, as, the, as the author at arm's length writing in the third person to fill in those gaps. Um, so it's a it's a, a life that that is is in that way kind of very intertextual. Mm, wonderful, yes, that is Dostoevsky in love. Thank you for that, Alex. Uh, Elizabeth Oliver was mentioning that his first connection to Dostoevsky was probably similar to lots of people watching and to mine as well, discovering him as a teenager when you're about 15, 16, 17, and you think, yes, I want to read about this Raskolnikov character. Um, how did you first come to Dostoevsky originally and what led to you deciding to adapt White Knights for the stage? So I first came to Dostoevsky actually because of Chekhov. So I came uh, at um, him from a from a Russian playwright perspective of, um, and and that was actually when I when I first went to, to drama school and and it took me a long time to work out how to say Chekhov's name, uh, <laughs> and, and then that that series of challenges continued with um, Gogol, who I've also adapted, and and then Dostoevsky, um, and and like Alex. Um, I sort of had an, I, I did have an image in my mind that I would just start reading all of these brilliant books and sort of, you know, in a, a very romantic image of myself, you know. And then the more I dived into the writing of, of these amazing, amazing authors, um, it all became much more real and relevant to my life. 
So versus it being just a place of escape where I would go to these other worlds and imagine, you know, long frocks and vodka drinking and cigar smoking and all of that and um, passionate love affairs, it just it started to ignite lots of feelings in me about myself and, and my real life, which links to why why we did um, White Nights, A Sentimental Diary of a Dreamer, uh, this summer in Pitlochry. Um, we did um, a series of um, Dostoevsky um, adaptations um, on audio, which, which people can still listen to, with our winter ensemble. And one of those was White Nights. And I decided that we would uh, produce it as a play. Now, if you jump back 10 years ago, I commissioned a version of White Nights, which another playwright wrote called a brilliant playwright called Steve Hubbard. And he did a fantastic adaptation, which was very different and um, involved bringing to life all of um, the dreamers imaginings. Whereas this adaptation that I did this year for the audience, um, what I realized as I was adapting his work again was how much his pieces are about loneliness. And White Nights for me tapped into what a lot of people would have been experiencing because of their isolation during the pandemic. You know, there was this man walking through the streets on his own, not able to connect, not able to talk to people, not able to, to find somebody else to, to meet in that way. And I, and I think that's what a lot of people have been have been struggling with the last year and a half. So not wanting to do a COVID play, really, although we did do a COVID requiem to end our season to, in respect for the people who have lost their lives uh, during the pandemic. But also wanted to explore what it has thrown up for us. Um, and White Nights felt like the perfect thing because it's about this extraordinary man who wants to um, find love and have moments of fullness and happiness and passion um and it doesn't work out um but at the end he's left going is this enough for the whole of my life these last four nights is is that enough and for me that felt like a an important conversation to have with our audience outside in our amphitheatre although Charlotte Higgins reminded me today that an amphitheatre does have to have an audience on all sides and our amphitheatre doesn't it's on three sides so it's not quite an amphitheatre if we're looking at the true definition of the word um so yeah I'm, I mean it just feel he just feels totally on on the on the money around lots of things that, that we're all struggling with in this moment I would say thank you Elizabeth I don't think you're going to get arrested by any court of amphitheatre definition police you can get away with it here uh, I love this idea of him being the ultimate pandemic author discuss uh, if you have any thoughts on that or any other questions please do put them in the box below and we'll get to them a bit later in this conversation uh, Oliver you mentioned this idea of his relevance to a modern audience and in particular uh, the term self-hatred and he absolutely whether biography or in fiction is the epitome I mean he's the king of understanding self-loathing right and that I think that is something that's very relevant to a modern audience uh, and Elizabeth mentioned this idea of his explorations of loneliness which is a really prevalent theme in his work and um, in what ways do you think he is embraced as being a relevant author now and do you think that he's just as relevant in academia as he is to a contemporary readership who might go and pick up um, his translations in in a bookshop um, I know I find it really fascinating that you escaped him as an undergraduate you know and there was a time in academia when he wasn't particularly fashionable or essential and I wonder if that's changed and how that relates to contemporary readers uh, big questions. Um, yeah, well, I, first thing I almost feel like doing is resisting the academic general divide. I think it's um, not to Dostoevsky's advantage because there are so many wonderful books that have been written recently, you know, un, from academic presses that are jargon free, that are sh short, uh, or many of them from, for example, Northwestern University Press in the States, and that are on topics that are entirely relevant to, I think, what the general reader also tries to get from Dostoevsky, you know, um, topics to do with trauma, pain, loss, 
family. Um, so I see, you know, the relevance I see it being across the board. Well, one thing that's um, really amazed me is how much correspondence I've had after my translation came out in 2014, 2015. I mean, from every part of the world, um, letters of one kind or another. I mean, some people simply saying whether they did or didn't enjoy it, usually did, because otherwise they wouldn't write, did enjoy the translation. But often it's about asking for my opinion or wanting to share a view on um, a character in the novel, or often, as just yesterday, a question about um, Brothers Karamazov, you know, I totally get the logic of the Grand Inquisitor's argument, you know, um, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the heart of the novel. Uh, but how does how does Dostoevsky, but I don't understand how Dostoevsky counters that argument in the novel, which is a whole challenge Dostoevsky set himself in the novel to, to, to suggest that we, uh, we could uh, take responsibility for our lives and embrace our freedom, as it were, and uh, the, the, the religious argument behind that. And I just thought how, um, you know, how direct people's response is to Dostoevsky, but also how that ties into this whole question of um, what, what Alex was talking about, what um, Elizabeth is doing, the way in which people continue the conversation that Dostoevsky started. You know, he, he leaves his, all of his novels and are unresolved. Um, so, some of them, like Brothers Karamazov, were told there's going to be a sequel. Of course, Dostoevsky died. Whether or not there would actually have been a sequel, no, one's, no one knows, but it's part of his strategy as well, that um, you know, the characters are there for other people to continue. So for example, there's a theater director in Moscow who I think has returned to Dostoevsky's works eight times, Kamaginkas, uh, picking out one character here, one character there and making the whole play revolve around them. So it's, it's, it's partly the fact that, um, I can't quite remember the quote, but Bakhtin said something about Dostoevsky hasn't sort of fully become himself yet. He's still waiting to become Dostoevsky. It's for us to make him, to, you know, to, to, to complete him or, or to take it, take it further. So, um, uh, so, so that, that's part of the answer. But I think the relevance is simply he writes, uh, yes, there's a textual side that uh, uh, Alex was talking about, but that's in a way part of the realism of Dostoevsky that you know, that was his filter for seeing the world. You know, he did uh, you know, he was, a, he was, um, you know, his arms were deeply soaked in ink, but on the other, but on the other hand, what he's writing about are the most direct forms of suffering and the most direct questions that we all encounter, you know, why, why should innocent children die, etc. Why, why should loss, um, illness, uh, uh, injustice are, are obviously, um, no less relevant now than they were then. So, and I think it's the directness with which he confronts um, uh, pain and, and trauma that, that, that means, and also the way in which he helps, he helps people to, to think their way out through them. Uh, and that's what the brothers Karamazov was in Dostoevsky, as Alex writes about, had lost uh, his own youngest son from a, from a, uh, uh, um, a brain condition very similar to his own shortly before the writing of the novel. Um, he had been to seek consolation from elders in a monastery. Uh, he, he'd received some help through doing that, but his wife was absolutely distraught. And the, the book is dedicated to her in sort of recognition of her loss. And the book deals with the theme of children and the loss of children's lives. So, um, yeah, let's go. Yeah, the idea of Dostoevsky as a family man or as really a, a human a human being with, with feelings and, and sort of ridiculous romantic adventures uh, as, as somebody other than a, a great author on a pedestal uh, is something I think is, is quite new to a lot of readers, um, contemporary readers. I'm thinking of you know, people who perhaps have only read Crime and Punishment and, and haven't necessarily delved into the details of Dostoevsky's biography before. Um, Alex, what have you found is the response from readers towards Dostoevsky and love? Love, and what has surprised them um, to learn about him and his character? It's a good question because he's, I mean, I think for, it, for good reasons, people want to talk about his ideas. You know, the, the fact that he takes his readers seriously, as Oliver says, and, uh, and, and wants to open up those very difficult discussions. I think it gives so much credit to the reader and he's, he's really good at staging debates between characters and turning them into action in his fiction. So uh, you come away from one of his novels with 
all these things you want to talk about. And, and, and so I think, you know, it can be tempting to, to, to sort of treat him as a floating brain. And that's, that's definitely how I did for, for a long time. Um, but he also, I mean, apart from the fact he just had one of the most eventful lives of any novelist ever, uh, it, it was a, a, a wild roller coaster of life. Um, but it also, I think, in understanding his relationships better and, and uh, his social circle, the people around him that he cared about, I think it does kind of add um, add in a new perspective. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I have to hold my hand up and say before I started researching the book, I didn't really see him as as a family man, as someone who to whom uh, having children, being a father, would have been particularly important. But it it's uh, it's a huge part of his life, particularly in the last ten years, and uh, and and once you know that, you you begin to see things that you missed before in or I, I certainly found I did in uh, especially in his later works you know the idea that children really are the future and that um and that everything is riding on the next generation he, he even towards the end of his life he was such a hopeful person I think he was disposed towards looking to the future and uh and I think that makes him take children and and their concerns and the way that they're going to go in the world uh, really seriously in a, in a way that a lot of serious uh, you know so-called serious no, novelists don't sort of somehow see it sometimes as their purview because it's seen as somehow uh, domestic or or that it you know it's not within the, the realms of um, ethics or philosophy mm. so there's loads of his personal relationships I, I I think do kind of help to inform the way you read him and, and get the most out of him Hopeful, serene, argumentative. He's certainly never boring. Very, very difficult to pin down. That's what I love about him. Uh, Elizabeth, tell me how audiences responded when you first said we're going to be putting on uh, something by Dostoevsky. I'm, I think I'm right in saying that he never himself wrote for the theatre. And there have been a number of adaptations of his work, especially in Russia. But he isn't primarily prim primarily associated with theatre. And I wonder how modern audiences respond to that and think, oh, no, I'm not quite so sure I want to go and see Dostoevsky play. Or were they very open to this? Sort of a mixed bag, really. Um, and, and audiences tend to... Um, respond unpredictably and differently if that makes any sense at all so sometimes you um share with them your plans and they go yep great really up for it and other times not so much we had exceptional word of mouth after we opened and um because it was only a short run but it received some fantastic reviews then obviously audiences are really keen to come um, so we're looking to revive the production um, because it was um, so successful. But I think I think it's really interesting to look at how audiences react to Russian drama. And I was lucky enough to see the Mali produce Uncle Vanya and um, by Chekhov. And um, it was in Russian, um, which... Is, is not a language that I'm as familiar with as, you know, someone like Oliver is. Um, and um, the audience was laughing the whole way through it. They absolutely loved it. And it, it made far more sense of the humour, I would say, because I think, so this is what I'm getting at. I think sometimes, um, in my experience, British theatre makers don't quite get the humour of Russian drama or Russian literature. Um, it's like at the start of The Seagull, Masha goes, uh, you know, um, he goes, why do you always wear black? And she goes, I'm in mourning for my life. She's making a joke, you know, and, and, it's, and, and, and in the same way as with Dostoevsky, quite often he is doing a funny mm -hmm. in order to then have that moment of total heartbreak. You know, he's, you know, um, Annie Castledine, who would um, love this conversation if she was if she was still with us, because she was the person who opened up my life to Russian literature, um, would have said, remember, it's like a souffle. You know, remember, it's like, you know, it, it's meant to be this this thing, this this thing that is that is light, but not lacking in 
richness you know but 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 treat it like a souffle stop malleting it she would say you know and and I think there's something to be learned from that when 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 reading the work as well it, it sort of give in to the tragedy of it through its humor you know it, it, and 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 always I I I can hear Annie chuckling as I'm you know I've got next to me you know, a couple of my, oh, you can't see them, there we go, a couple of my my, my storybooks um, to get me in the zone for this conversation. And, and always I, I find myself laughing, you know, and I think that's what he intended. He, 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 he was up for the gambit of emotions um, to help us understand the meaning of life. So, so yes, I think the audience was surprised how much they chuckled in answer to your question. Uh, Viv as well I think yeah they were surprised by that yes Dostoevsky in fun souffle shocker love that uh, Oliver Elizabeth was mentioning their language and the question that always comes up around Dostoevsky and money, many of the other Russian greats is can we ever really understand them if we read them in translation What's your take on that? And how did you grapple with that for the English language reader as you were working on the translation of Crime and Punishment? Goodness, um, <clears throat> that's a hard one. Um, it's actually quite hard to look back uh, at always and be sure that I can trust what I was think I was, what I thought I was trying to do at the time I was trying to do it. Now that it six, six or seven years have passed, I've been surprised, for example, how many readers or critics have said that it's a modernizing translation, whereas that wasn't in my mind uh, when I was doing it. So, of course, that is one approach that one can take. One can radically try to bring it into the speech of today. Um, when I was doing it, I was trying not to use words that only come into English actually quite recently. I was sort of aiming for some sweet spot, I suppose, between Dostoevsky's time and our own. But perhaps some of the changes, including punctuation that were made, and, and well, that was actually the only significant editorial change pushed it towards that. Um, that's not really an answer to your question though, which is how, how can we approach Dostoevsky's language? I, I think um, we can't, entirely um, and I mean if you just take you know Rus the Russian Russian words are, are structured differently they they use verbal prefixes a lot there's just one prefix which is crucial to the novel pierre so meaning across or again a crime is really transgression it should be called transgression and punishment is a stepping across all of those words to do with across are crucial to the novel in the very last paragraph Raskolnikov is, we're told that he crosses Pirechod into a different category of people, uh, not to mention rebirth is, is gestured at, which again is that same prefix. So you wouldn't be able to find that the, actually the, the, the theme of translation is also central to the novel, I found to my surprise, and that again is another of these words that uses the same verbal prefix. You wouldn't find a way of capturing that kind of intricacy with which we don't necessarily associate Dostoevsky, which doesn't have to be totally conscious in a way. Uh, it comes some, somehow organically from his thinking and his um, art. Um, but I was amazed as I was translating it at how rich the sort of the patterning is um, and how skillful the way in which, um, so I was talking before about, you know, we're plunged into this hot St. Petersburg, which feels stifling and where people live on top of each other in these poor districts. And Raskolnikov himself lives in a room that's like a coffin right at the top in a garret. And his mind is constricted. He can't get away from these obsessive thoughts that he has about whether he's a Superman, whether he should do this murder or not, whether he can do the murder. And I was struck as I was translating it by how actually the, the range of words in that first part, and then again towards the end of the novel is very narrow. Lots of key words keep repeating again and again. And that was something. I tried as best as I could to replicate in English to, to make it have that kind of neurotic, um, obsessive feel. Um, of a, it's a bit like you know people who know St. Petersburg, those big courtyards that are um, closed on all sides. We call them a dvor kalodiets, so a, a, a courtyard that's like a well. And it's a bit like Raskolnikov's consciousness and like his language. It's deep but narrow. He keeps returning to the same thoughts, um, and so. That effect is really important as we lead up to the murders. But then it's interesting how much later in the novel Dostoevsky finds an entirely different way of writing, especially in the epilogue. 
uh, Raskolnikov has been advised, you need air, you need air, talking about souffles, <laughs> you, need, you, need, you need to sort of, um, you know, you can't, you can't live like this in this urban way and in, in, in this coffin room. Uh, and, and he ends up in the same fortress that Dostoevsky was as a, as, a, as a prisoner, looking out on the Kazakh steppe. And there you have the sense of timelessness, you move into a totally different reality and the sense of space. And again, I wanted to, to evoke that contrast and that, that was something one way of doing that, and this sounds very probably nerdy, but is again through punctuation in a way that when, when, I, when we were in Raskolnikov's mind, I was always contracting the verbs and I have, but I've, I'd, we'd, whatever it was. And then just to give it a sort of sense of slowness and timelessness to then decontract the, those verbs, for example, made, gave, gave a different rhythm to the epilogue. Uh, I think people, are, I mean, what we're talking about in this conversation is all the sort of stereotypes people have about Dostoevsky and how those crumble when we read his work. Um, I mean, Alex was saying, you know, people think this is such a deep writer, is full of ideas. And one of the profoundest things I heard when I was doing the novel was a friend of mine, I'm sure he won't mind naming him, Tommy Carson, who, who said, um, God, Dostoevsky hates ideas, doesn't he? And when you start looking at it like that, that actually the novels, I mean, yeah, you see, he's a pandemic novelist, but it's also about the pandemic of ideas and the way in which people get infected by ideas and, and crime and punishment. Certainly, in the end, unfortunately, Dostoevsky himself got infected by ideas, it must be said. And this is a celebration. He led, you know, he espoused some ideas that many of us find uh, horrible at the end of his life, sadly. Um, but, um, but in his novels, he's more intelligent than he is, I think, in his journalism, as he himself realized. And he, and he is dealing with the power of ideas and the need to resist them in many cases. That's where the, that's where the big conflict is between theoretical life and lived life, if we're talking about the living Dostoevsky. And he was always trying to get through to living life, um, and, and one way of doing that was through literature, but, but it was always against being abstract, being too theoretical. Yeah. Mm. Wow, Oliver, that was just a translation masterclass. I've never thought about that idea of peria before, prestuklenia, literally means stepping across. So I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about it either, even after I started doing the novel. <laughs> and it was a colleague here, Philip Bullock, who made me aware of it in the seminar. And since then, I yes, it opens a lot up, actually. Um, well, it does, because it so clearly makes a reference without actually making a reference to transgressing a moral boundary that's just there in the background it's incredibly but it's clever. also but also what i found amazing is as i say this theme of translation is right there in the center of the novel in one of the most crucial chapters where um sonia the woman who loves raskolnikov reads to him from the gospels and reads the raising of lazarus um we are told very explicitly by the, by the narrator she reads it in a Russian translation, which would seem to be superfluous. Why do, of course it's in a Russian music, no. uh, but actually it's very meaningful because in, it's only then at about this time in Russia that people could read the Bible, the New Testament in a vernacular translation and a translation that people could understand, not in church Slavonic. A translation would be done about 40 years earlier, but it had been banned in case people actually understood what they were reading. And so it's, the, the New Testament as a translation has a sort of um, transformative and revolutionary effect in the novel. Uh, and then we also learn about Raskolnikov, that he could have been a translator, his best friend is a translator, not a very good translator, uh, but Raskolnikov would have been a good translator. And at a certain point, he's offered translations. He says, no, I don't need translations. And the next minute, he's offered some money as he's crossing a bridge because he's mistaken for a beggar. And he throws that money into the river. And, he's told, and, and the narrator says at that moment, he sort of cut himself off for more humanity, going back to the theme of isolation. And just lastly, another point he's described as a walking translation by his friend, uh, a translation from a foreign language. Uh, and so one way of looking at the book, this theme of translation is that Raskolnikov needs himself to be translated from into his true self, into his better self, away from this kind of inauthentic. And that's another of these crossing overs that, that I was talking about, which this prefix carries and yes, it can't be, it can't be, I don't think, captured. Um, in English, totally, but can at least be, be, be gestured towards and understood. Um, well, people will just have to watch this conversation instead as an addendum to being able to understand the full effect of Pierre 
at all times. Alex, how does it make you feel hearing all of that? And that I'm assuming that you approach your material as a non-Russian speaker. I think you speak a little bit of Russian, but um, not fluent and you wouldn't have read everything that you've used for um, Dostoevsky and Love in Russian. How does that make you feel about how you approach him uh, as, a, as an English speaker? Yeah, it, it's something that I think, um, you know, I, I felt initially that I was approaching the subject as a novelist, uh, primarily. Um, but I was very aware of the fact that I was kind of coming to him very downstream. And I and so I wanted to read a lot around that that whole topic of translation, the, the difficulties and, and, you know, there's each translation will, will make gains and have compromises uh, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of be able to highlight certain aspects of of, uh, of the, the original text. So for me, it was it was kind of partly a question of trying to find um, a consistent voice and one that was you know broadly reliable that 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 I could use as a as a kind of a base for my source. Uh, but but actually, that the, there being no no completely perfect translation in the English language of a, a Russian piece of text. Um, I found it really useful to read at most of the, at least the, the kind of main works that I was referring to, I read in at least one translation. Um, so I've, with something like the notes from the dead house, notes from the house of the dead, as it's sometimes called, memoirs from the house of the dead, someone else translates it. You have to look into why, you know, why are people uh, why is there this ambiguity around the initial word and the title? It's because it's a Russian genre that doesn't really exist in the same way in English. And uh, so you have to be kind of alert to those, those issues. Um, the main translator that I used was Constance Garnett, who I, um, I just really enjoy the version of Dostoevsky that comes down to us through her. Uh, but I, I'm aware that, that, that you know, there, there are criticisms that have been made that her work is somehow too sort of smooth, um, that she's a very elegant writer who kind of suits, maybe suits a writer like Tegenev, who's a, a great sort of, turns out a great sentence, and that maybe she had um, sanded down the, the rough edges and the polyphony of, of the voice in, uh, in, in Dostoevsky's writing. So uh, I, I had to, to try to work to build that back in, and part of that was, was reading secondary translations. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it, it was really, it was really a fascinating process, actually. And I loved, I, I have a, a friend who was sort of helping me with that, that I could only find one uh, translation of all of the letters into English. And so I was uh, working with a, a friend who speaks much better Russian than I do to, to um, uh, kind of ask about certain words and, and phrases that didn't seem quite right to me. And, and we had some amazing conversations about all these were, you know, the kinds of things that um, Nabokov picks up on these weird words that don't seem to have a, a direct translation into English, which give a great sense of, uh, of, of Russian habits of thought that, you know, the, the famously invoked words are, are particularly Tosca, which is a kind of melancholy, which, which only really exists in the Russian soul. Um, and Nadriv, which is a this sort of herniation, uh, this kind of straining towards, um, which we don't really have any word for at all. And, and actually what I decided to do, ra rather than to try to sort of fudge it into English, was, was to be very upfront with the reader and say, this looks like a really interesting word. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss it from, from Russian and uh, everyone argues about how you translate it. Well, I think that's one of the reasons people come to books like yours is because they want to read about those details and they love reading about, you know, what would it mean if you could understand the word Tuska? Do we experience the same kind of sorrow? Um, Elizabeth, as somebody who's clearly really passionate about a living version of Dostoevsky, how you bring that alive as a performer, um, what would you advise as a point of entry for people who want to dig into Dostoevsky, maybe rediscover him after having abandoned crime and punishment years ago? Where would be a good place to start? I would definitely start with his short stories. 
it's probably a controversial thing to say. I'm looking forward to hearing what Alex and Oliver say next. Um, I would definitely say that just because they're short, uh, quite simply, and you can sit down and go, okay, how do I feel about this person's um, lens on the world? And I do think there's something about them which, again, combines the humour and the, um, the pathos as well. I would say that I do think that crime and punishment gets a bad write-up. Um, full stop. Um, it's, it's a mighty good read. Um, so, so I also think there's something about going at um, Dostoevsky as if, and thanks to people like Oliver, it is accessible to us, um, going about it and seeing it as a new novel that's just come out versus is seeing it as something that you have to dust off the shelf. I think that's where we get ourselves confused. We sort of go, oh, this is going to be hard going because it was written a couple of hundred years ago. And actually, that's not the case. So, um, yeah, I would say plunge in with it with a short story. But then I, I also say that about Brecht. I say about, you know, if people go, oh, you know, how do you feel about Brecht, who I love? Um I go start with his poems. I mean, don't go near his place to begin with. I mean, there's an argument to say that Brecht's poems are actually best in his place, but that's a whole other evening, I would say. Um, but yeah, you know, start small, work your way up. But um, yeah, don't don't believe the bad press would be the, the thing that I would add. Yeah, well, I second your recommendation. I would say uh, the double is a really, really great place to start. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, Oliver, does that count as controversial for you to recommend the short stories as an entry point? And, and um, no, no. Um, I, I really wanted to ask Elizabeth a question. Can I do that? Yes, about, of course, about go for it. Talking about the shorter form. So you, the choice of, of White Knights is such an interesting one to, I mean, I, I wish I'd been able to see, to see the play, obviously living a long way away. Um, but it's not the most obviously, and I can see why you chose it from the point of view of, um, as you say, the theme of isolation. It's a brilliant choice. Um, I'm just curious about what dramatic potential you saw in it. Uh, you know, it, 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 when you read it, it doesn't obviously seem like something that's going to transfer to the stage because you know it's lots of long monologues, and um, you know there's not that much action. But perhaps that was part of the appeal to you. Um, so there's two things and I'll try and be really swift. So the first thing is the first version I commissioned, which I didn't write myself, I asked the writer to really um, put, put on the page um, uh, words and situations where we could theatricalise what Dostoevsky was talking about. So at the beginning of, of um, Sentimental Diary of Dreamer, for those people who haven't read it yet, um, he, he speaks about the fact the houses talk to him. And, you know, to the point that, you know, one of them is, you know, going to go yellow and it's like a canary, you know, it's, it's, it's all very funny. So, so we actually brought those imaginings to life. You know, we saw the man who was chasing Nastenka. And, you know, so, so, so in that regards, there is a lot of drama to be found if, if, if it becomes... Um, for want of a better word, literalized or, or mimetic of, 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 the, of the adaptation. However, what we did this summer in the version that I adapted was keep the monologue form. And, and I should absolutely hold my hands up from the off and say, dramatic monologue is one of the things I find most exciting about theatre. Uh, it turns a lot of people off. I love it. Some of my happiest times as a director have been uh, directing Faith Healer, Brian feels faith healer. Um, I've directed a lot of monologues during my career. And that is because I believe that a character can talk to an audience. And in the act of that confessional act of speaking to the audience in monologue form, they are fundamentally changed inside in the same way as the moment when um, Shakespeare wrote to be or not to be, although Robert Lepage did argue that it was to do with needing to do a scene change. But I do believe to be or not to be is, 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 is Hamlet trying to make sense of whether he should be here or not be here anymore. 
and those extremities of feeling and 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 um, intellectual, emotional, psychological turmoil that he's trying to process with an audience, I believe is equal to what the dreamer is trying to do in White Nights. You know, I believe him sharing with us what happened over those four nights is, is him trying to make sense of actually whether he should be here anymore. Um, so, so in that regard, I see quite a lot of drama in it, Oliver. I, 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 I feel it in my being, as you can tell, you know, that sense of... Um, it, sounds, it sounds wonderful. I, I didn't mean that it shouldn't be done at all. It sounds, it sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear it's done in that way. And, uh, and again, maybe that's um, also part of what we were talking about earlier, this sort of wanting to have this direct access to the author and to the words that, 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 that the monologue um, allows and that that somehow seems appropriate right now to this moment as well. Um, I mean, there was an amazing performance in Oxford of um, Ray Fiennes just reading the, um, the four quartets, you know, just standing up on stage and just on memory and managing to, to um, sustain. Oh, I wish I'd say in a performance for, for, for whatever, however long it was, an hour or so. Um, yeah, I really, I really wished I'd seen that. Well, we're all going to have dreams of great big yellow canaries chasing us across the stage after this tonight I think it really brought him to life there Elizabeth uh, now let's move to some of your questions if you have a question do pop it in the box below we'd love to hear from you I'm going to address this to Alex um, but anyone else is welcome to pick up on it if you have a take on it it is quite a this is quite a tough question uh, Dostoevsky provided a sophisticated and complex picture of mental illness. How is his work still relevant to how contemporary clinicians understand psychiatric illness? And Alex, I'm referring that to you because I wonder if you could perhaps give people a bit of background about what we might call Dostoevsky's own psychiatric illness. Yeah. So um, Dostoevsky had very severe epilepsy. Um, he, he may have had it his whole life. It was definitely confirmed to him in uh, the time after he came out of hard labor in, in Siberia. Um, but there, are, there were episodes in his young life where um, he that were kind of passed off actually at the time as almost sort of comic episodes where he was introduced to a young woman and appears to have fainted. Um, there was a moment where he seems to have hallucinated that someone had um, screamed that there was a wolf in the woods where he was when he was a young child. And that was sort of written off as a childish fancy, but it became increasingly clear across his life um, that he had very severe, uh, what we would, I think, call now temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so I, I think he writes particularly well about the subjective experience of epilepsy. Um, he was really, one of the things that he was really devoted to was uh, trying to write truthfully about uh, what goes through a person's mind. And, and actually in that way, he was very far ahead of his time. What think, uh, techniques that we would think of as being quite modern, like stream of consciousness, uh, or, or even just the admission, you know, for a, a main character, a protagonist to admit to kind of deeply ungenerous uh, thoughts or um, he, he was so interested in those com complexities and that that was, you know, he was always interested in the mystery of the human being and, and his main subject of study was himself. You know, he, that there's a bit of him in many of his characters, um, particularly when it comes to uh, the one of the main character or, or one of his main characters in The Idiot, Prince Mushkin, um, has the same affliction as epilepsy and describes uh, in, a, in a kind of really poetic way the, uh, the kind of corona that comes just before an epileptic fit. And it, it's this moment of um, which he says is uh, unearthly and he's very keen to stress that doesn't mean that it's uh, paradisical. It's not, it's not a paradise moment, but it isn't of this earth. It's, it's a, a non-human feeling. Um, and he kind of stretches out the, the moment 
just before the epileptic fit. The fit, of, of course, itself is horrible, deeply painful. Some of his fits um, lasted for, for hours at a time and he, he would, could spend weeks recovering. Um, but he was so interested in those last moments of consciousness and, and stro strove to kind of capture them uh, right up to the very moment of unconsciousness, which is something that um, is quite rare in literature. But I think he actually writes, um, I, I think he's more interested than most writers in, um, in others who've been affected by disability. Um, there certainly he has characters who have compulsive tendencies. Uh, there are people who are very clearly in, de in depression. And it, it, you know, I, I don't think his tendency isn't necessarily to, um, to kind of name these things and, and to sort of pathologize them as such. But he's very interested in, in the ways that uh, the human mind can, can uh, become a, a prison for the, the individual. Um, and, and, you know, mental illness is, is clearly a, a big part of that. Mm, thank you. Elizabeth, a question for you. If Dostoevsky were alive today, what aspects of modern society do you think he would be focusing on in his writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think he'd be focusing on the same themes that he is focusing on because I don't think they've gone away really. I, I, that, that's my kind of very crude answer to quite a complex question um, because what he was obsessed with is, as Alex has just spoken so eloquently about was 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 the the turmoil of the human condition which remains the same and although for instance clinicians may have names for things and insights for things that they can treat chemically and with talking therapies there's still people in turmoil because of 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 illness um so yeah i don't i don't think he would be speaking to or exploring different things, just different contexts, probably. I don't think all of a sudden he'd be writing his Boris Johnson novel or his, you know, I think he'd, I think he'd steer well clear, probably. <laughs> Boris Johnson is a, is a Dostoevsky in character discuss. That is a whole other event, maybe one for like 25 years time. Yeah, I think a bit of distance would be needed. <laughs> yeah, definitely, um, in more ways than one. Oliver, um, question for you. You mentioned earlier this idea of redemption, that no one is quite ever redeemed uh, in any of Dostoevsky's work. Could you explain a little bit more about that and perhaps explain why it is a powerful literary technique and not simply failure? Well, I think part of the reason I said that is that because so many people think it is a failing of his writing that his characters are, you know, given a revelation or, in, and, and then that word redeemed is sometimes brought in. Um, I think, um, uh, certainly if we're talking about the time of crime and punishment, um, there's a fascinating note that he writes just a couple of years before that novel. Uh, this is going to sound extremely Russian, but he's sitting next to his the corpse of his first wife. And um, he, he, he writes this, and it, there aren't that many, this speaks to Alex's project, there aren't that many moments like this in Dostoevsky's complete works where he actually speaks in his first person, clearly about himself without any kind of mask. And uh, that, that was an unhappy marriage, um, unlike his second one, which starts, you know, at the end of crime, at the end of time of writing Crime and Punishment. Anyway, at that moment, he says, will I ever see Masha again? And that's really all he says about his first wife. Um, and he goes off on this um, digression about Christ, really, and about faith. And you get from it this um, very sort of clear spiritual worldview that Dostoevsky has. That he develops in this, this two or three page ske sketch that all human beings are kind of caught between sort of two truths. There's the truth of at the higher end of, of Christ, as, as, as Dostoevsky saw him as the human ideal, because he was selfless. But, but that ideal is something we can't attain in, on this earth. Dostoevsky thought it's too perfect. Why not? Because we're dragged down by our ego, by our I, and by our desires, etc. And so he sees, he sees us, I think he sees all of his characters as always um, 
oscillating between these two extremes, sometimes closer to one, sometimes closer to the other, but always in motion, always on a kind of journey, to use the modern cliche, but a journey in Dostoevsky's understanding that doesn't have a destination and while we're alive anyway. And so that's why a character can't be redeemed in that worldview, because there's no stopping point. There's no, um, there's no, there's no resolution. But there is that kind of horizontal, that's the sort of vertical axis. And then there's the horizontal axis there that we were talking about, about moving across from one state to another, or, uh, one, one category to another, and that's possible. Um, but I think this ground that the idea of trying to reach some ut earthly utopia is for him a dead, cold and inhuman concept. And that was really lay at the heart of his hatred of the whole idea of communism, socialism, and what he predicted was happening in, in Russia um, at the time. But that, as I say, is why he lends himself so well to his novels and, and himself as a character, as a, as a person, to the kind of reinterpretation and sequels and transpositions. That's a word that an American scholar, Alexander Burry, has used. Instead of talking about adaptation, that we, we are trying to that we'd never quite reached the original, but the idea of transposing his novels or his stories into another medium or into another genre. Um, and that's, in a, I think it's in a very Dostoevsky spirit. I think what Elizabeth has done and what others do with his, with his texts is exactly what he would have wanted them to do in a way, to be brave and free with them and sort of continue that, um, that dialogue. <clears throat> Question for Alex. Uh, Oliver mentioned that Nabokov was no fan of Dostoevsky and he certainly had enemies uh, during his lifetime and after uh, he died. Um, do you feel that he had friends and allies during his lifetime? He did. He, um, I, think the, I think the thing that um, is sometimes hard to sort of reconcile in hindsight is, is that he, it, in some ways, the literary world he was writing into was very cliquey. And uh, there weren't all that many cliques you could join, really. There, there were the people who were signed up to the, to the very left-wing radical cause on the one hand. You had these very conservative pro-Tsar, Slavophile uh, writers on the other hand. And there were only a limited number of outlets that would sort of service these, these different political opinions that were emerging after censorship eased up. So the, the trouble is that he really wanted to, uh, I, he really believed he was trying to steer a middle course between everyone that would kind of help to reconcile the, the contradictions between these two different positions. And, uh, you know, he, he founded a journal with his brother to try to do that. Uh, I think he, that, that was kind of part of what he wanted to do with his, with his novels, was to show where there were elements of, uh, of, of Russian and Western thought that could live alongside one another. And, you know, there were these sorts of slightly dangerous Western ideas that maybe we should sort of throw out and, and um, trust ourselves more. Uh, he was obsessed with this idea of getting back to the soil, as he called it, which was to, to kind of reconnect with uh, folk tradition and the, the peasant class that were very alienated from the elite at that time. So depending on what time you catch him, and, and what exactly he's talking about, he would find a ready audience with the radicals, um, pe people who were seen as being very left-wing. Um, you know, the f but, but the first thing he would do, he, he published um, a novel that was really successful, Devils was in, uh, he had two good hits in a row um, with Katkov, who was the conservative guy who had a really conservative journal. And he was really building up some steam with his conservative readers. And his next project was basically telling Kakov to go away and <laughs> selling his novel to his arch rival at the contemporary. And then just at the point where he'd sort of, they'd finally accepted that he might be coming around to their, their school of thought, uh, he went back to Kakov again. And it, so, so he, you can see throughout his life, he kind of doesn't help himself. <laughs> Every time he, um, he finds someone who he's sort of aligned with, he'll be a fellow traveler for a, a couple of years and then they'll fall out over something and, and have a big... I mean, I'm, when I say I was being slightly flippant earlier when I say he was argumentative, I mean, he, he could get into arguments 
but he was argumentative also in the sense he was incredibly discursive. He loved to, to he loved the stuff of argument, the back and forth of it. And, uh, and he kind of did that a bit with his, with his politics as well. I think you've read so much Dostoevsky that now you basically you say, Alex, um, I'm not, I'm not argumentative. I'm discursive. What are you saying? <laughs> It's such a Dostoevsky thing to say. Now, um, I'm going to ask at least one more question, but to make sure that we've fully, fully uh, serviced the idea of living Dostoevsky so that we've got people uh, to go away with some living artifacts that they can go to after this conversation. Um, can I come to each of you in turn? Elizabeth, can you tell us where we can find the audio um, that you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, so if you go to uh, YouTube and you just search Pitlockery Festival Theatre in Dostoevsky, it will, it will come up uh, just through a really, really simple, simple search. And it's obviously free for you to enjoy at leisure. And there's lots of other short stories and, and things on there to listen to as well. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and Oliver, how can we make, this is a question that I've slightly pondered all my life, actually. Um, how can we make sure that we buy the correct translation what would be the quickest and easiest way to make sure that people get your translation of crime and punishment into their hands uh, so it's penguin but it doesn't look like the other penguins so there you go uh, it doesn't it hasn't got the normal type instead it's got these and this is another form of ad adaptation transposition it's got a wonderful friend to the novel um, it, um, Mikhail Shemyakin back in the 60s, which show Raskolnikov, not as he's portrayed in the novel, as handsome and sort of dashing, and, but as sort of ugly. Uh, Raskolnikov as he imagines himself, in a way. And so if you see any, anyway, if you see, if you see these, these really striking illustrations, both in the UK and then in the US edition, they got a cartoonist to do the cover, so you can't really miss that one. Uh, and there's big pools of blood on the cover. There's also an audio book that's now been done, read by um, Don Warrington. So. Oh, wonderful. Love an audiobook recommendation. Um, and Alex, tell us about Dostoevsky in Love. This is a biography, a quick read, uh, and really exciting take on Dostoevsky's life. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's um, very briefly, it, the idea was to try to write something that was accessible. You don't have to know anything about Dostoevsky going into it. Uh, and to write about his, his life, uh, his kind of personal life. So it's Dostoevsky in Love um, takes you through particularly his three great loves um, as he saw them and, uh, and, and tries to kind of um, bring in the, some of the themes of his, his novels as well. So that was published by Bloomsbury this year. Wonderful, thank you. And to really make sure that we have underlined the idea of living Dostoevsky, I want to put this question to you. It's a great question. Uh, there needs to be a Hollywood crime and punishment. Uh, it needs to be done as quickly as possible. Who plays Raskolnikov? Oliver, I'm going to come to you first. I'll come to each of you. I can't think of a question I'm less well suited to answering. With. <laughs> and I also can't imagine something I'd less like to see. Sorry. That's why I asked you first. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so Oliver is not going to be first in the queue for tickets to see Tom Cruise in Crime and Punishment. Um, Alex, who would your Raskolnikov be? Well, I think this is, I, I accept in advance that this is a rogue choice. I, I actually think Timothy Chalamet would be amazing because he's, he's just the right amount of kind of thinking he's great, but also being mistaken. And I think he's sort of dramatizing this weird tension between these ideas that he's cooked up in, in his attic room and, uh, and the real world of people that he has to live alongside and, and try to find sympathy with. Uh, I think it would be an unusual, uh, but potentially quite productive choice, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a dramatist, so I'm very curious to hear what Elizabeth thinks. I love that, Timoteo Chalamet, brilliant idea. Elizabeth, you're the person who could potentially bring this to life for us. So who would your Raskolnikov be? Oh, I don't know. Um, I do like this game, though. Sorry, Oliver. Um, uh, it's a game that I often play with people. It's actually a really good way to, to cast things, to kind of go, who would it? I mean, it just has to be 
an incredible actor. So I would punt for someone like a young Matthew McConaughey, probably, uh, because I think he could land the the complexity of what's needed and, and, and the he'd also I, I think it needs to be somebody that's capable of, of meta a metamorphosis so I think you know if we see him in Dallas Buyers Club I think that sums up the fact that he's got chops as I would call it so yeah so I would say someone like Matthew but then that's a bit like why why are we going down the American route then then we get into another complex conversation about what we should be doing is um finding the finest of the finest Russian actor to to play the part and then there's a, a conversation there about you know um what that would mean for audiences and the experience and uh so yeah so I don't know that's that's a very very good question which I will I, con I, I can contribute something which is yeah, one that I heard on the radio as COP26 was starting um Schwarzenegger was being interviewed on Radio 4 and he came up with the conclusion um technology will save us all which is a misquote of Dostoevsky's uh, "Beauty will save us all." Dostoevsky doesn't actually say it in his own in his own words, but uh, I'm really not sure he would have agreed with the sentiment that technology will save us all. But it'd be interesting <laughs> to know what he would have thought about the process. Yeah, wonderful. No. Go on, Elizabeth. No, I was actually just wondering what we do think he would have thought of the climate crisis, and I'm relieved that you said climate crisis, Oliver, because I think that's how we need to start referring to it versus change. Um, so yeah, I would, I would be, yeah, I would be intrigued to hear what everybody would think of that. We've probably run out of time though, but yeah. Well, his one specific philosophy, as Alex mentioned, was the philosophy of the soil. So. Yes. Well, we've covered everything from Arnold Schwarzenegger to Souffles to Dostoevsky's philosophy of the soil. I really feel we've brought him to life tonight. So thank you so much to our guests, Dr. Oliver Reddy, Alex Christoffi, author of Dostoevsky in Love, and Elizabeth Newman from the Pitlochry Festival Theatre. Thank you so much to all of you for your questions and for being with us here tonight. Thanks to the British Library for hosting. Please do check out all their other events online and coming back to life in person. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. I've been Viv Groskop and this has been The Living Dostoevsky. <laughs>